and welcome back to the Detours in Music podcast. My name is Laura Rupel, and we are in Season 3, Episode 14, an interview with Mark Gibson, the Director of Orchestral Studies at the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music. I hope you enjoy. My name is Mark Gibson. I'm the Director of Orchestral Studies and Professor of Ensembles and Conducting at College Conservatory of Music, University of Cincinnati, and I'm the Music Director of the CCM Philharmonia, its top orchestra. I also serve as the head of the Miami Music Festival Conducting Institute and CCM Opera Boot Camp. And when did you get your start in music? My mother found me uh, listening to a recording of Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto when I was four years old with the, with the music and I was in the right place. Mm-hmm. Or so she thought maybe it's time for him to start piano lessons. So I started lessons quite young. Were you always playing piano growing up? I also played violin okay. uh, until uh, my senior year in high school, and a, a very influential pianist, Rudolf Serkin, advised me that I could not serve two masters. I could either do one or the other. So I, I decided to focus on piano at that point. Mm-hmm. So, when you were playing piano growing up, where was that shift for you thinking, okay, this is not only something I'm good at, something I like doing, but something I want to pursue? That's an interesting question. I knew I was good at it. I knew I wanted to pursue it, but I can't say that I necessarily liked it. Mm -hmm. I was brought up in a family where everyone, all of the, uh, I have, um, there are five kids in my family and we all played a musical instrument. It was part of our upbringing. Mm -hmm. Turned out to have this unusual ability mm-hmm. and uh, I was I wouldn't say I was pushed into it I, but it, it I kind of went there by nature I guess is what I would say mm-hmm. and then where did you attend school and why university you mean mm-hmm. my family moved out to Minneapolis from New Jersey when I was 10 years old and I started um, when I was 14 taking lessons with a man named Paul Freed at the University of Minnesota uh, and I enrolled for the beginning of my undergraduate at Minnesota because of uh, Professor Freed, who was incredibly influential in my playing. In fact, my daughter's named after him, Paula. Uh, but then he said, before I graduate, he said, you have to leave. Mm-hmm. The teacher I know at New England Conservatory in Boston, Theodore Lutvin, I think you should go try to get into his class, which I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I went to, I finished my bachelor's in New England with Mr. Lutvin. Then he went to the University of Michigan, and I uh, followed him and did my master's at Michigan. When was conducting something that you were incorporating? So when I started my master's at Michigan, I started to play opera rehearsals for for money. Okay. And uh, the head of orchestral studies there, my mentor and teacher, is a man named Gustav Meyer. Mm -hmm. Uh, And... Professor Meyer, Mr. Meyer, encouraged me to play more piano and then gave me little conducting assignments, had me coaching singers. And this has always been the the kind of the time-honored path into conducting going through the opera house. Mm -hmm. Uh, Eventually, I kind of made a shift. I don't have a degree in conducting. I just learned conducting through through opera. Mm -hmm. Did that ever feel like you were kind of letting go of piano? It was odd. One year at Michigan, I was playing Brahms' second concerto with the orchestra and the concerto competition. And the next year, I was conducting mm-hmm. so the concerto competition. My teacher, my piano teacher, um, uh, who taught me most of what I know about playing, I, while he encouraged me a little bit to go into conducting, I can't say he was thrilled about it. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, it just seemed that that was the natural course for me. Mm-hmm. I, I, I have a kind of a, a knack of working with singers and enough uh, nerve to stand in front of a group of people and look like I know something. Yeah. When you're working with students and you're conducting students especially, um, what are the qualities you think that kind of make someone able to be transitioning into it? conducting because you know none of us start off just as a conductor so i'm curious what those qualities are 
let's put it this way. I'm suspicious of anybody who does start off wanting to conduct. Yeah. And the first question I ask any prospective student is, why would you want to do this? Because it is a terrible field. <laughs> it's an awful line of work. Um, I think one's one has to make sure that one's motives are, are pure as a word. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just say honest. Let's, mm -hmm. I don't believe in deceiving oneself. What I look for in a student is transparency. Mm -hmm. I look for somebody who is guileless. I look for somebody who's really smart. I look for somebody who's really musical. Mm -hmm. Somebody who can get along with me, frankly. Yeah. Well, the challenge, I, I don't know how it is on oboe, but I mean, to learn conducting, you ha or to be a conductor, you have to have a certain amount of ego and a you know, strong mm -hmm. sense of self-worth. Yeah. But as you've seen, mm -hmm. my job is to challenge that sense of worth every moment that the student is on the podium. Yeah. Because frankly, that's what happens in a professional orchestra. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I need to find somebody who's strong enough to not to talk back to me, but to stand up for themselves mm -hmm. with the knowledge of, of the score. And that's, of course, yeah. as you know, what we focus on mostly is, you know, mastery of the score. Yeah, because of course, you know, you not only have to have a musical idea, but you have to Give it to 50 people and be strong enough that if anyone disagrees, you're like, no, I'm, I know what I want. <laughs> no, or I have, it's not even that I know what I want. Mm -hmm. I'd like to think that I have an idea of what the composer wanted. Mm -hmm. And that's the objective. I, um, the great conductor, Eric Lyonsdorf, wrote a book called The Composer's Advocate. I'm sorry, what the composer wanted, not what the conductor wanted, what the composer wanted. Mm -hmm. And that's my job is to advocate for the composer who's often um, dead. I mean, mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of time playing a lot of music by any given composer, which doesn't give me the authority to say this goes this way. Mm -hmm. Or somebody has to be the arbiter of taste. And frankly, I wish it were only 50 people. It's often more like 100. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's not, it's not me being right. It's me having the responsibility to say, this is what I think Schumann or Brahms or... Uh, um, Jesse Montgomery meant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've done the research. You know, we've practiced the instrument. You've done the. Yeah, I like yeah. to say I have the roadmap. You're on the bus with me, but I got the map. Yeah. And uh, I'm a bus driver. <laughs> glorified, pretty glorified bus driver. Has your career focus changed? Um, so you started conducting mostly with operas. So I'm curious how that has kind of influenced where you've gone. I like to say that the business makes Buddhists of us all. You don't work unless somebody offers you work. Mm -hmm. And you who have auditioned, let's say, for various orchestras or positions, mm -hmm. you're hired, you're not hired, but you don't have that choice. Yeah. Nobody else chooses to. I've had situations where I got jobs that I didn't think I was going to get, like this job, the University mm -hmm. of Cincinnati. Uh, and I've gone where opportunities presented themselves, um, San Diego Opera, New York City Opera. When I was at the City Opera on the music staff, a colleague said, there's an opening in Barcelona. So I went to Barcelona. I'd had it there and was looking for an opportunity in the States, and then an opportunity came up in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So you go... As in any journeyman, journey person phase of their lives. In terms of detours, no, I guess. Mm -hmm. There have been highs and lows. I have a, I have a, I draw many, many truly awful pictures of what the trajectory of the business is. I guess this is it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, here you are, and here you think you're going to go. Yeah. But that's the path you take none That's of us exactly my point yeah none of us takes that path and none of us ends up there by the way even in, in this drawing of this wonderful career trajectory you end up here yeah uh so yeah you you have a, a general direction but no you don't you don't answer when the phone rings mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what was something for your career what was one of those um unexpected turns no, it's the same day. Mm -hmm. it, it was in February 25 years ago in Birmingham, Alabama, where I was principal conductor of the Alabama Symphony. 
and there was a group of faculty from CCM who came down to see me do the concert. I had already auditioned and interviewed here, but they wanted to see what I was like in another situation. Mm -hmm. And that same concert, which is a subscription week, it was Freischutz um, Overture, Concierto de Aranjuez, and uh, Sibelius too. A program, by the way, I would never put together of my own. It was given to me. I would never. Three more disparate pieces I, I couldn't imagine. Um, that same concert was the concert where Alabama decided not to hire me as music director and the concert where CCM decided to hire me as the director of orchestral studies. Yeah. And so there you have, that is the perfect example of a situation where mm -hmm. I did, and it turns out that I got the better position, frankly. Yeah. I was blessed 25 years ago to be, to be hired here and it is the greatest job in the world. I'm a, humbled and honored every day I walk into the school. Yeah, I think you make a great point. You know, for music, we often don't make the choice of where we go. <laughs> so I guess how, when you're guiding students and when you reflect back, how do you feel like it's best to prepare for that or just kind of release that um, control that we want to have? <laughs> well, I think the first thing, Laura, that I've learned through, through failure, mm -hmm is that if I don't know the score well enough, I'm not going to be ready for any opportunity. Mm -hmm. That has happened to me. I have, I have not been able to take advantage of opportunities that I was given because I just wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared. Or... I'm a late bloomer as a conductor, it turns out. Um, but I, I had opportunities that I, that I couldn't take advantage of. So the most important thing is to know the score and to have your skill set. Mm -hmm. uh, show up on time. Yeah. And yeah, then, be prepared, be on time. Those are pretty. <laughs> do your best, and it's uh, your colleagues on occasion will ask to do mock auditions for me, and they'll go off and do auditions. And the first question I ask is not whether you got the job. Mm -hmm. The first question I ask is how did you do? Because mm -hmm. that's the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. If you did well, if I did well, eventually, yeah, I'm going to get a position. Eventually, you're going to get a position. Mm -hmm. my, my boss in San Diego Opera, Tito, Cap uh, Tito Capabianco, who's a great stage director, said, if you're really talented and work hard, we can't keep you from having a career. Mm -hmm. We can make it difficult. We can reroute it. Now, this is literally what he said, but yeah. we can't keep you from having a career. And the, I think the reason I have a career, this career, mm -hmm. is I just worked harder than anybody. Mm -hmm. And you know this about me and about my students. My students just work really hard. Yeah. And that will pay off. Mm -hmm, definitely. Have you ever kind of fantasized about another career path outside of music? Well, yes, I'm, but I think I'm too liberal to be president and I'm too small to play baseball. <laughs> okay. I do have another career. I'm an author. I, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm writing now uh, the eighth edition of The Modern Conductor for Oxford University Press. And uh, I love writing about conducting and about music. Um, and uh, it's something I will continue to do even after I leave CCM. Mm -hmm. What are some of your goals for the field of conducting, I guess, or your work with your book or with the CCM Philharmonia? Just kind of things looking ahead of what you're trying to do. My goals are not for me. My goals are for you and for your colleagues and mm -hmm. for my students. Um, to, to teach a higher level of musical literacy so that uh, you and your colleagues mm -hmm. can be better musicians and then pass that on to your students and the audiences that will hear you play. Mm -hmm. my, I've, I'm, I'm blessed. My ambitions have been realized. Mm -hmm. I'm... Uh, there are very few pieces on my bucket list to conduct, the pieces I want to do, but mostly now it's a matter of training you and your colleagues to be gainfully employed mm -hmm. and part of the infrastructure of music and art. Yeah. Do you think as your career has shifted more to, like you said, like bucket list is smaller, so you're more like, thinking of the bucket list for teaching, do you think that's impacted how you're interacting with students or? No, I, 
I don't know that I would say that. I would say it's less about me than it used to be, probably. Mm-hmm. But I still like to get up on the podium and conduct, and I like you know, I I had a my music hall debut this past summer with Bohem and the Cincinnati Opera and Cincinnati Symphony. That was mm-hmm. fun. I mean, I, mm-hmm. it's it's fun to conduct on that level and yeah. make money, frankly. Yeah. Uh, but I no longer aspire to that as much mm-hmm. um, in terms of how it's changed my teaching. Uh, 25 years ago was very different than it is now. The, env- the social environment, post-pandemic, post-George Floyd. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm 25 years older than I was. Mm-hmm. Uh, luckily, I have a daughter who's 25 and who kind of keeps me informed as to Dad, this is what's actually happening. Dad, you can't say that. You can say this, etc. So I do have a, a a little finger on the pulse mm-hmm. of you folk. It's important for you and your colleagues. I'm going to be fatherly for a second. Mm-hmm. It's a stressful time. Mm-hmm. And in this profession, as you well know, just because you get a degree, it doesn't mean that you're going to walk into a job the next day. Yep. <laughs> I think it's important to learn patience. I think it's important to have hobbies. I think it's important to have a realistic view of what a successful life looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, And to be patient and joyful. Um, And I'm trying to remember when I was your age. um, And I remember how hard it was. Mm And a lot of my job now these days with students is to reassure them that if they work hard, that there is a path forward. Mm-hmm. Again, it's not going to be the path that you may have wanted. My father used to say, it's going to be okay. It's going to work out all right. It's not going to be what you wanted, mm-hmm. not to be what you expected, but it's going to work out fine. So mm-hmm. long you keep working. So what we teach is a work ethic. We yeah. teach people literacy. Mm-hmm. And we teach, um, as you know, because you've been in my concerts and rehearsals, we teach a certain level of intensity Mm -hmm. towards mastery. And mastery is, for me, uncompromising. Mm -hmm. Mastery doesn't, doesn't, isn't affected by the pandemic. Mastery isn't affected by social change. Mastery is mastery. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm trying to share now with my students in the orchestra and in my conducting class. Yeah. And frankly, to be masters of this challenging life. What do you do with your life when you're not in rehearsal, when you're not making reads? Mm-hmm. If you're not making reads, then you're not doing your job. You know? What gives you joy? How can you find joy every day? Because mm-hmm. without joy, the music making will not be will not be what it could be yeah i think patience is kind of the the overarching term that you said it's you know we develop these skills but you know just because we don't walk out of school with a job doesn't mean that we don't have those skills and that it's not going to come well and that so there's the issue of mentoring which i do a lot of with students who who leave Mm -hmm. because most of my students only stay here for two or three years Mm -hmm. in which point they've learned by which point they've learned like my ideas on craft, my ideas on score study, but then mm-hmm. how to help pers- people get the next position, how to help people prepare for an audition, how yeah. to help people prepare for a competition. Um, that goes far beyond uh, the degree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lifelong learning, lifelong teaching. Mm-hmm. My daughter is now in Portland, Oregon, where she's the newest employee of the Portland Trailblazers. Never thought she'd be working for the for an NBA team, but her one of her first contacts there was one of my first students, uh, Dr. Lance Inouye, who is the director of orchestral studies at Lewis and Clark College hmm. in Portland. And I'm going to go out there next month. The other thing that I really believe in, Laura, is family, the hmm. family, the family of orchestra, the community of sound. And that's something we, gosh, we work really hard at. It was really nice to get to sit down with Professor Gibson and talk about his career paths. Um, Something that you all couldn't see was that 
drawing he showed of a trajectory in music that he shows his students and I kind of laughed because it was really exactly what I talk about on the podcast. Um, Imagine kind of a mountain drawing that has a lot of highs and lows um, and he had the arrow from start to top of what you think your path is going to be, you know, and instead it's a lot curvier. So I thought that was absolutely perfect and I I kind of liked that he described that as not having any detours. It's like, no, this is just, it's not possible to not have that. So I really appreciated that. I think he had in a visual aid exactly what I like to talk about on this podcast and kind of expose to younger, younger minds that nobody did it from point A to point B. Like we go through the whole alphabet of the career in music. As always, thank you for listening and I hope you catch our next episode. Mm-hmm.